Guys, uh, welcome everybody again. Um, it's so nice to have you here. So we've got two people that doesn't un understand Afrikaans because one is from India and one from Malawi. So let's speak English today. Um, uh, the, heavenly language. the heavenly language. So just be be gracious to to me um, for my English. Uh, just just bear with me. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Albert. <laughs> so, of course, but some. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, you are faithful in every way. And Lord, if we speak about leadership and being leaders at Leaven of Word Centurion, we ask, Lord, that you will give us wisdom and insight, that you will lead us well. And if you lead us, that we can go forward in our wisdom and know, Lord, that uh, we are leaders that lead others in your steps. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the last few days, in my quiet time, the Lord has been speaking to me about, if you wait on me, I'll show you to solve problems, and there's a few problems that need to be solved. Donkey Lucia. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a few things that, that really needs to be solved and, 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 and done in the, in the few uh, weeks ahead, months ahead. Uh, nice problems and, and solutions that, that we prayerfully need to, to consider. And I really experienced that the Lord said that when you seek my face, I will proactively give you answers before the problems happen. It's sort of, Lord, help. What do I do here? And the Lord says, instead of sort of sorting out the problems when, you, when it occurs, why don't you ask me so that I can give you solutions before it happens? And then I realize, okay, that, that's a good thing. Um, I'll rather do that. Wait on the Lord and do that. And, and it's part of what I want to talk to you about today, uh, a principle um, of um, generational leadership. Now, let me first just, uh, Yuri, won't you just share that word? Can you translate it? It's, it's actually Carly's word that she sent to him. She should have been here. So he has to quickly translate it in his head. We'll help you translate. The revelation Carly had was um, can about... I quick, the can I quickly give the context? Yes, yes so you can give the context. There's a, there's a garden uh, at uh, Coulage Congregation. What do, you call, what do they call the garden? Uh, experience... The prayer garden. The prayer so, garden yeah. that you experience the stations of the cross there. A beautiful thing. Um, and Carly has got a heart to guide people through that garden. We and Coulage work well together. We, uh, we are two congregations that work well together. So she said to Pastor Ernich, listen, can I help you guys to guide people through this garden? So she they actually taught her what to say and how to do it. And while she stood at a certain station, she had this revelation. It was of the birth of Jesus. Mm. And See, had this revelation of the wise men is people that can sow financially into the kingdom, but with wisdom. They won't just sow to so many. They will really sow it where it's needed. Mm. Then the, um, the shepherds is people that can really pray with you and pray for you and what is for sorg? Yeah, care for you care for you um, they know of sitting at the lord's feet so that they can care for the sheep and then the angel choirs is the worshipers to worship god um, in everything you do 
and then um, King Herodes, Ier- yeah, the people who just want to um, vernita, kill, and destroy, destroy, huh? and that yeah. was our uh, and and that was so wonderful that she had this revelation while sitting in the garden at that specific point. She realized that at the birth of Jesus, there was people present that was business people wanting to invest in his ministry, a prophetic act of investment in his ministry. There was pastoral people that's there to care. There was an angelic host that worshiped, like ours. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then there was even the critics that wanted to kill. Um, and they were all present, or all part of the story. Luckily, Herod wasn't there present. He was only there later. But, but it was actually part of his, his birth story. And to us, it should be also um, wonderful to realize that there's, there's different people in his church as well. People that invest, people that care, people that worship, but even the critics. And um, so if if we talk about different people, I want to share a a, a principle with you that we actually learned from uh, Bruce Wilkinson years and years ago. Bruce Wilkinson had this thing of the three chairs principle, and he taught us this, this principle uh, and recently, Craig Rochelle also talked in his leadership podcast about the three generational types of leaders. A generation one leader, a generation two leader, and a generation three leader. Uh, Bruce Wilkinson spoke about a, a first generation Christian, and then a second generation Christian, and then a third generation Christian sitting on different chairs, being different people present in the church as well. And we should realize this. Now, you sitting on one of these three chairs, I'll explain now, but in your cell group, in your worship team, in your youth group, in your group that you are serving, in your women's group, there's, there's people sitting on the first chair, second chair, and third chair. So let me explain. If you turn in your Bibles to Joshua, uh, first turn to Joshua 24, verse 15 to 16. It says, and it seems Joshua speaking. He says in Joshua 24, verse 15, in, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <clears throat> As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a, it's a joke in our house. <laughs> my wife bought this poster at a flea market. As for me and my house, we will. What, what did it say? Ek en my huis, ons sal die pad van liefde en vrede. Ek en my huis, ons sal die pad van liefde en Listen, you can't start with a scripture and end with a fluffy thing. So every time I saw this thing, it frustrated me. I said, can we please throw this thing away and get a thing that says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Nothing else. It says scripture, not some scripture with a fluffy ending. But as for me and my house, (laughs) my problems. (laughs) <laughs> but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. We are with you, Joshua, first generation, first chair, server of God, servant of God. So the people serve the Lord all the days, and I'm at Judges 2 verse 7 now. The, so the people... Uh, served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. So there were people that says, said, Joshua, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We are with you. First generation servants of God, we are with you. And then there were elders that also served the Lord 
because they saw how their parents and Joshua and the people that went before him served the Lord. They saw that. They saw the miracles. They saw the, uh, the faith these people had. They saw the blessing that they walked in. And because of that, they also served the Lord. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Verse 10 says, When all the generation, Judges 2.10, When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, they died. Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work he, which he had done for Israel. So do you see the three generations? Joshua and the men that lived to see the miracles. Then the ones who heard of the miracles and saw the faith of their fathers. But after they died, there was a third chair, third generation, third group that didn't serve the Lord. Now, to us, the, the three chair principle is in these three generations of David. It's best explained if you look at David's life, served the Lord himself, wrote Psalms, was a king that, that loved the Lord, loved the Lord's presence. He wrote Psalms like, better is one day in the, in the house of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. Lord, I seek your face. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Lord, I need you. A real personal relationship with the Lord. And then his son took over from him. And his son also served the Lord. Built a temple. But the palace was more important to Solomon. He also built a palace. Had 700 wives. Although he chose wisdom, he had 700 wives. That's 700 mother-in-laws, by the way. <laughs> That's not a wise decision. <laughs> so maybe he started wise, didn't end up very well. But, but remember, he served the Lord because he saw the blessing on his dad's life. He saw the kingship move from, from Saul to his dad's life. He saw that his dad was blessed. He saw the accumulation of wood and gold and ivory and, and all the things that were there for, ready for him to build. He couldn't have built if it wasn't for David. He walked in the slipstream of David's blessing. And he realized that. And that's why he served the Lord. But it sort of wasn't his own conviction. It was because it was his dad's. And then unfortunately, because of his hypocrisy, his way of life, him trying to serve the Lord, building a beautiful temple, but also building idolatrous uh, temples in Jerusalem. His son, Rahabiam, knew that being the third generation, he doesn't want to have the brand of servanthood that his dad had and his granddad had. So he was a third generation and actually turned his back on God. And that in today's life is like that in Christianity, unfortunately, I'll show you now, but with business as well, with a lot of things in life as well. So in, in, in the Christian life, we see people in church serving God. They, they might have a rough life being rough people. Being in a biker's gang like Vaynard was. Uh, but, but, but being rough and doing maybe sinful things. But getting to know the Lord personally themselves. And a lot of you that's sitting here are first person, first generation Christians. You met the Lord Jesus Christ yourself. But some of you, like me, grew up in a home where my dad served the Lord. 
My dad went to church. My mom and dad, Sunday after Sunday went to church. They read, read, read out of the Bible. They were Christians and they served the Lord. But I went to church because my dad went to church. I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I was frustrated with the eagerness of my, especially my granddad, Sarol van der Merwe, of, of him serving the Lord with all of his heart and being fervent for the Lord. I, I think I was even a third generation Christian if I think of it. But what happens to Christians in the second generation is they sort of live a hypocrisy life, Sunday Christians. Listen, we make all the right moves, we say all the right things, we do all the right nice things, but when, we, when it comes to Monday, we do bad business, shady deals, we curse like the world, uh, watch Netflix and funny TV stuff like the rest of the world, uh, do things that the rest of the world do, because you don't know if, you don't know Jesus yourself personally. And unfortunately, in church, in Leaven of Word Centurion, there's a lot of second generation Christians. And what happens to second generation Christians is they frustrate the third generation Christians. <laughs> Christians. Because they're Christian in name, but they don't serve the Lord. Their parents used to go to church, but they know their lives. They, they, they sort of listen, they listen to their negativity, uh, saw how they, their Christianity looked like, and they thought, nah, no, I don't. I, I don't see this. I, it's not going to work for me. I'll be a Christian but I don't go to church. Have you ever heard of some of those? I'll be a Christian, but this church thing is not for me. I've been hurt by hypocrites in the church. Uh, it's frustrating. Uh, uh, you know, I serve the Lord in my own way. <laughs> by the way, there's no own way of serving the Lord. There's only... The real way of serving the Lord, being a first generation Christian, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself. So, unfortunately, what happens when you're a third person, uh, third generation Christian, you get frustrated with the way the second generation set an example to you. And because of that, you'll rather leave Christianity, think out an excuse, go another way, be a Christian in name, but don't go to church. In Afrikaans, we've got the saying that says, from van kruivas toet na kruivas toet van drie geslachte. Het jylle dit al ooit gehoor? Het is een Afrikaanse sedem. Het is actually a spreekwoord in Afrikaans. Albert? Nog nie gehoor nie. <laughs> Van kry was toet tot kry was toet vir drie geslachte. It takes three generations to push a wheelbarrow, to be the poor first generation leader, economical leader, that works hard to push a wheelbarrow because you build up an a empire, build up a, 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 a money for yourself, work physically hard. And then what happens to that first Electrician, that first mechanic, that first builder, that first uh, guy that really, really work hard. He's got enough money to now send his kids to university. Say, so, listen, you, you won't make it in this world unless you work hard. You need to study, go to university. Uh, you need to, to equip yourself. You need to have wisdom, Solomon. And then this guy has got the accumulated funds of his dad 
that his dad left, left him. He's got his own empire's worth of money that he's got. But you know what he does? He raises kids that's entitled. It doesn't want to work. Why do you have to do this? My dad, we've got so much money. You don't really have to do something. And then the third generation inevitably squanders the money. Third generation leaders are squanderers. They waste everything. And then what happens? Their kids push his wheelbarrow. From Kraiva stoot, tot Kraiva stoot, vat drie geslachten. Dan stoot hulle weer Kraiva, want daar is niks meer geld oor nie. The, the, the money has left. Everything's gone. They wasted everything. Blue collar to blue collar. Three generations. So, it's something to think about. First of all, you need to, to think, where are you as, as a Christian? Where are you as a Christian? Did you go to church with mom and dad? Who of you went to church with mom and dad? Okay. Most of us are either second or third generation Christians. We must be careful. There's three words that Jay will. Jay, can you not buy them? Lucia, must give it Jay. So, in a clear. Morgen, three verschillende clear. Three verschillende clear. File, kijk at my now. <laughs> so, uh, the, the thing is, guys, if you think of it, you're... Huh? <laughs> so, first generation Christians. First generation Christian is somebody that has got a real relationship with Jesus himself. So, I said to you, I'm, I think I was a third generation. My grandfather was, uh, he worked in the railways in Germiston, had six sons and one daughter. Um, he was a shunter and lost his hand, right hand, in between the trains. Had to work with his left hand only. Uh, and build beautiful wooden things. I still got a wooden cabinet in my house that he built with only his left hand. Uh, uh, but he served the Lord with all of his heart. I can remember going to the Gereformeerde Kerk in Germiston and always finding my granddad at the back there. We all pass him and he'll give us toffees to chew during the service. <laughs> but my, dad, my granddad served the Lord. Had a personal relationship. He, he was a, uh, in 1907, lost both his dad, mom and dad just after the, the Boer, Anglo-Boer War. Thank you. And um, then my dad served the Lord because he saw the fruit of, of, of serving the Lord in my granddad's life. And I was frustrated with what I saw instead of encouraged. And I was a third generation Christian, going to church, doing all the right things, but only a Christian in name. And praise God for friends that prayed for, for me. Because I went on a RCS fear camp, on a Christian student camp uh, at Winkel Spreit, gave my life to Jesus Christ and became a first person follower of Jesus Christ. And what happens with, with first person people in a family, first uh, chair followers in a family is that second chair and third chair people in your family don't understand you. They think you're weird. 
So what happened was, <laughs> for instance, I'll tell you this story. I don't know if I've, if I've ever told you this story, but I, I uh, for instance, came back from this RCS fear camp, and, and one of the things that I learned in my early Christian life was I read the book of uh, Floyd McClung on the Father Heart of God, one of the best books that I ever read about, uh, the Father Heart. And I realized my dad didn't know, really know the Father. And I realized that I need to show my father the father's love because my dad doesn't know how to show me love so i decided to start kissing my dad that didn't go well so my mom came to me she said she said listen your dad's very concerned that you're gay so will you rather just shake his hand stop kissing him so that actually hurt. <laughs> it was a big issue. The wonderful story is that eventually I let my mom and my dad, they were staying in Delmas later on in their lives. I led both, both of them to the Lord and I baptized both of them. And my dad used to hug me. He said, I, I can, can, can still not do the kissing thing. Well, I'll hug you. But my dad became... From, from a second chair Christian, became a first chair Christian. And I'm so glad about that. My mom is a really, really on fire first person, uh, first chair Christian. Uh, I get WhatsApps every day about scriptures. So, um, and that to me is a blessing to see my mom's faith and her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. So, can I ask you, one of, one of the things that you need to establish in your heart is, where are you? Are you in church because of your mom and dad? Because of following somebody? Or are you in church because of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I assume that none of you that's sitting here is a third generation Christian. And if you are, first or second, a third or second, today is the day that you have to have a first relay, first chair relationship with Jesus Christ, that you have to have a commitment, that you make a commitment towards Jesus. So the, the, first, the first chair is a commitment relationship. The second is a compromise relationship. There's... There's a lot of compromises in your Christianity. And the first, the third chair Christians are ones with conflict in their Christianity. Now, if we talk about leadership, you get first generation leaders that's pioneers. They start things. They, they're not scared. They start new things. They... Um, jump in they're a bit like bulldogs like bull terriers more <laughs> bull terriers uh, so uh, starting a church in Dalmas in 1994 uh, we had this experience of being first generation leaders in Dalmas and it's difficult it's a lonely road it's hard it's difficult but it's a commitment road. But whenever you get people that takes over from you, I had the privilege of having Marius van Staden in our church and uh, establishing Marius and Marlies van Staden as the ones to take over from us, walking a two-year road with them to hand over our church to them before we came here. They are second-generation Leaders. Now, they've been second generation leaders at Westerlich as well before they came to us. Inevitably, in your makeup, if you're a second generation leader, you are much more cautious. First generation leaders are a bit, uh, how, do you, how can I say, um, unverantwoordelijk, um, irresponsible. They, they just jump in and go for it. 
But second generation leaders are much more cautious because these guys had nothing to lose. But these guys, something's established now. In Delmas, there, was, there, there wasn't, there weren't, wasn't any church in Delmas. And we had to establish it. And after 20 year, 22 years, we left a building with a good bank re, uh, uh, account and, and everything there. And there was something to lose for the second generation. They had to be a little bit more cautious. So there's, there's a few things being a second generation leader that's a little bit slow out of the blocks. But it's good. They establish. They, they um, protect the status quo. And it's nice to have good second generational leaders as well in the makeup. But once you have good second generational leaders, good Solomons, they build. They build the temple. They build the, uh, the, the, the palace. They, they build everything. And they establish. But once there's third generation leaders, they waste. They spend. <laughs> they spend all the money. And they can sort of run an organization down and destroy it without them knowing it. And before you know it, an organization like Leven the Word Centurion will be established by three generations. It will see the founder. I'm not the founder of this church, but it will see the life of the founder and the people with the founder through to the next generation. But the generation after that will close down unless, unless this third generation, the generations after us can realize, listen, we need to have a first generation mentality in our leadership. We need to, to be pioneers, not only establishers. We must rather be establishers if we are cautious in who we are, in our setup and makeup. But we definitely can't be wasteful, can't be spenders, can't run the thing down, because that's sinful. Are you with me? So, I want you to consider this. In your Christianity here today, you are sitting here on one of these three chairs. And I want to propose to you, we all need to move this chair, to move to this chair. You, you, you need to stand up out of the third chair or the second chair and move to this chair. And you can only do that by having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Can I, can I also say something out of a charismatic background? That I believe that first generation Christians believe in miracles. We believe in the supernatural gifts and miracles of the Holy Spirit. Amen, Joe. First generation. We experienced that. We saw that. We, we saw that in our own lives. Second generation Christians say, yeah, my mom and dad used to talk about those miracles. We, we used to hear that in this church there was something like that. These guys say, with me, when I, when I tithe, the Lord provided supernaturally. When I prayed for that person, he stood up out of his wheelchair and a miracle happened. First generation Christians have witnesses like that. Second generation guy says, I know of somebody in our church that prayed for somebody and a miracle happened. I, this, I, I've experienced this and this. Guys, and I want to, to say to you, be a first generation Holy Spirit filled believer that believes in miracles yourself. Uh, I, I, I've had experiences. I, I'm, I, the Holy Spirit reminds me of praying for a blind man in Zimbabwe. 
and the Lord opening his eyes. The guy starts running around. And I thought, what's happening now? He was blind, 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 but the Lord opened his eyes. And to experience a miracle like that yourself, laying hands on a guy, and the Lord healed him miraculously. It gives you a desire to see it more. I don't want to say, uh, I've never experienced it. So let me send you to a first generation Christian. Let me send you to Joe. You'll experience that with him. I'm always, no, I can do this. I've seen it work through my life. Let me pray for you. This morning, Lucia praying for, for Zuleika. Was she Zuleika? Who feel your knee? Ah, you see. And, and Lord, I'm going to pray for the sick no matter what because miracles have to come through laying of. I'm a disciple, so that it needs to happen. Second generation Christians, yeah. I, I knew somebody once that prayed for somebody and there was a miracle somewhere. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. Guys, we can't be there. These guys are skeptical. So skeptical. Miracles? I don't know. And, and I want you to see this. We spoke about church history today, students. In church history, there's first generation churches. Man, the, the power and the presence of the Lord is there. And then there's sort of second generation. We know about the power of the Lord. In our denomination, once there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit or something happening there, Martin Luther did something against the door somewhere there. And then there's a third generation uh, dead denomination that... Uh, it's only there for the buildings and if you look closely there's graves in the building and the outside have you ever seen churches like that yes. I, I've been to churches where the graves are inside the church that needs to say something they're already there they they the queen now we begraven binnen in a kerk I don't know if you have seen it they've put it inside the church no. We went to a church in Wellington just now to see the statue of, of uh, Andrew Murray. I, I wanted to take a photo of the statue of Andrew Murray. And I was so disappointed to see the whole church grounds full of graves. The, chi the church needs to be amongst the living, not amongst the dead. The church, please don't put grave, grave sites on our church grounds. Leadership years and years after me, Nicola, <clears throat> he's a youngster. Maybe you'll have children that you can talk to. In the word centurion's grounds, there shouldn't be grave sites or here us hockeys. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, this is a place for the living not for the dead. That just, it's just my little <laughs> pet irritation. Um, guys, you cannot be a leader. You cannot be a Christian and not sit in the first chair. You cannot be a leader and sit in the third chair. You can still be a leader in a second chair. Be an establishing leader. That's fine. Being a second generation leader, that's good. It's sort of all right. Uh, but you, you'll miss the fun of being a pioneer, starting your own business, Vibia. Huh? Man, it fat so big adrenaline and so big a bang gevoel in your pains. That's first generation problems. Something that the third generation will never experience. Praise the year. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Lucia is about to plant a church. Did you know this? Well, Carmen's coming with. 
<laughs> Lucia and Carmen staan ga op, Jaku en Reska staan ga op, because they also coming with. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit scared, because this is the thing of first generation leaders. They don't want to let anything change. They like how it is. But when you've got a, a good second generation leader that sees this and say, no, 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 I need to be a pioneer myself. I need to start something myself. I know how nice it is to let him go and do this. <laughs> be scared. It's frak, frak bang, ne? <laughs> but, but they have to go. Yaku? Here he bang. <laughs> it's, it's part of the excitement of leadership. You need that. Reska, alle keer wat jy denk, nee, ek kan ons nie maar hier bly nie. No, no, you need to go. You'll never experience this if you don't go. And this is not a secret to success. You still going to need to work very hard. But at least you'll say to one another, we've got nothing to lose, let's go for it. You've got a few things to lose, <laughs> Carmen. But at least there's no big church standing there that you can lose. Go for it. Go after the calling of the Lord, be a David, be a King David, and go for it. So we'll still announce this to the church. But the four of them are leaving, together with the two daughters, are leaving in January, December. December, I'll still decide when I'll, I'll, I'll let them go. I'm st still clinging. Um, <laughs> they're, they're leaving this December to start with services in Cape Town, City Bowl, in January. So they already started with a group of people uh, every Thursday. They had two services already. Three? Three. Three. Prayer, prayer meetings. Yeah, not services, prayer meetings together to pray for the church that's, that's on its way. And it's going to be called? Be Light. Be Light. That's the church. So the church is, will be in English, and it's going to be called Be Light. So, um, can we pray for them? Can we do that? We, we're still going to release them five, six, seven times in front of the church as well. But I think it will be good to tell the leaders this. And um, then do it in front of the church, morning service and evening service. But we're excited about what's happening. And this is growth. This is not easy. But first generation leadership is not easy. Guys, if we are here and want to protect and establish everything, that's easy. If we are here and don't care about a mors duet kerk that doesn't go anywhere, that's very easy. But I don't want to be here. I want to be here. I want to be a pioneering, church planting church. That's obeying Jesus Christ and his co uh, commission to go out and plant churches all over the world. So in saying that, let's stretch out our hands. Sorry, Lord, we want to come and, and, and just send the four of them. Come stand here for Hmm? Do I put you on a spot? Yeah. Lord, thank you for the four of them and that we as leaders can stretch out our hands and pray for them and realize, Lord, they are going, all four of them, as pioneers, as first-generation leaders. Lord, we realize it's scary, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's exciting because they obey you and put their faith out to say, Lord, we trust you. Lord, will you provide supernaturally? Will you guide supernaturally? 
And will you open doors and hearts supernaturally so that their church will be established and that they will grow? In, in, in what we said about prayer on Sunday, Lord, in order that your name may be magnified in Cape Town. That is our prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 See, somebody that wants to ask something or say something, I know if you can ask. Jackie? Anyone else? Who were? <laughs> Thank you, 50 plus, for serving them. And it was, uh, you never know who you anoint and for what you're anointing, uh, anointing them for. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Good. Thank you, Yella. So it's what you ever say. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sit the finish up, yeah. This, uh, so, so the, I think the great thing. Then angles. The, the great thing that that Bota took this opportunity to speak to the leaders is because all of you took time out of your busy schedules to come and be equipped by a fantastic leader. And Carmen and I, and I'm sure Yaku and Reska as well, see Bota and Dot as our spiritual mother and father. Um, so we are not not leaving. Pretoria or Centurion um, uncovered of ontbloot is the Afrikaans word um, exposed so well <laughs> exposed there. but we are leaving with spiritual covering and, and that's encouraging that's why yeah. we can do this because yeah. if we do this um, single handedly I'm, I'm sure it'll be a lot more difficult mm. so thank you it's an honor. It's, a, it's an honor to, to release you guys and to know that we are going to still journey together and have this. this it's, it's actually an extension of Levin the Word Centurion, like Shal and Zulika is an extension in Mosul Bay of this church. And it feels like that when we are there. It, it's it's Levin the Word Centurion at Mosul Bay. Now we're going to have a Levin the Word Centurion at Cape Town. Uh, so. It's it's nice. It's it's really a, a a great privilege to to send you. Not only to have you leaving our church, but to send you off, and bless you. Good. Back to this. This chair. Can you see? It's a little bit more uncomfortable than this one. Lucia, see It's becoming more uncomfortable than this one. <laughs> This one is much more comfortable. This one is nice. It's nice to sit on. Please don't be comfortable. Comfortable is overrated. You're not born for comfortable. You're born to pioneer. You're born to be there. You're born for relationship. You're born to go out and be daring, be brave. You need to be brave in your leadership. Try new things, take new risks, engage people, even if it's not your personality and you're a little bit shy, get past your personality. Be brave because you're a leader. And this is what the Lord has called you to be. Yeah. Magda, this is. Die het jou vir hierdie geroep. 
you're not here. And circumstances might have you here and feel sometimes that you're here, but it's not the calling on your life. The calling on your life, Magda, is that you are here. That's what the Lord has called you to do. Lord, I thank you for Magda's calling to be a first generation, a first chair leader, and that you, <laughs> she can't run away from this. This is who she is. She's there. Thank you that you establish that tonight again in her life. And that you show her this. This, this is what you, you uh, spoke to her long ago about. And during it tonight, she needs to hear this. Thank you, Jesus. If you are here tonight... And if you're thinking, I'm, a th I'm, I'm actually stuck as a third generation leader. I don't want to take any risks. I go on what other people say. I'm shy. I'm, I'm, I'm careful. I'd rather spend than save. Uh, if, if you're the guy that says, listen, I, I'm a third generation Christian. I haven't. I haven't got a personal relationship with, with Jesus Christ. They, there's, there's somebody that, that served the Lord before me, and I'm, I'm only here because of them. Then tonight is the night. Tonight the Lord wants to have a relationship with you. And I want to invite you to come and speak with us. Come and speak with me. Come and speak to Lucia. But... Take the brave first chair decision to go out and say, I want to be a first generation follower of Jesus Christ. I want to be a first generation leader from now on. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to go out there and lead well. So I, I, I want to conclude by saying, just one, one extra practical thing, that people sitting in your cell group, in your 50 plus group, in your band, can be in either one of these three chairs. And you need to know how to speak to them. How do you speak to a first generation uh, Christian that's together with you in your band? You can say, let's wait for the Lord's presence. Let's see miracles. Let's, it's another way of, of, of dealing with them and communicating with them. But these guys, they need to be kicked and say, guys, come on, come on. You need to move in your relationship. You can't be stagnant. You can't stay here in your Christianity. You can't stay here in your leadership. You can't stay here in your business. Jan, I don't know how to do for you. You can't stay here. You need to move. I don't know if I can miss it. Verskoon me. But the Lord says, mm, it's, it's time to make bold steps. It's time to, to be bold and to hear what I want to, to do through you. In your business, let's get back to ministry. Praise and worship group, Amalia, if there's some of them, lovingly, kindly, on the other come on. There's more in your Christianity. You cannot kick these guys. You'll kick them out of the church. Hear my heart. Albert, you need to love them. You need to care for them because they don't know God at all. You actually, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Romans 2 verse 4. You need to be kind, loving, caring, and then say, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Let me go and put you in this chair. But you have to wait for the opportunity. 
the demon would serve with you, and you might realize in the worship team, hopefully there's none of them in the worship team. <laughs> I really hope so. But in the 50 plus or your cell group, you know, youth group, there might be some of them sitting there. Be patient. Wait. Wait for the Lord until he says, okay, now challenge them. It's time for that guy to move to this side. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, show me this. You'll, you'll realize some of them. Once you start speaking to them, yes, in all clear in your cup, baby. Ah, my customers in here is too. No, no, no. You can hear it. You can hear it. You can hear it. Be patient. Careful. Let your vrou met hulle work. <laughs> so, so, these guys, you can challenge them. You need to encourage them. You need to say there's more in your Christianity than just being a Solomon, building, establishing, hanging around, sitting in church. Come on, you need to be active. Be a pioneer. Follow Christ fully. These guys, be soft and gentle. Love them. Love them well. Lead an example, exemplary, exemplary life towards them. And you'll lead them to, Christ, to Christianity, to Christ. Good. All of you have got these people in front of you. You don't always know if it's a first chair, second chair, third chair. We hope... I hope my whole congregation is first year Christians sitting in front of me. Wouldn't that be nice? If I preach on Sunday, it's Lucio. It's Amal, first year Owens. Yes. Let's wait for the presence of the Lord. Miracles will happen. But unfortunately, it's not true. It's, it's, it's not like that. There is some that's, that's there because their mom and dad brought them there. They're there because that's the Christian thing in South Africa to do is to go to church on Sunday. You don't go to the movie, you go to the church. And there might even be people in church that don't know why they're there. <laughs> they just dragged along. Okay, I'm here now. What now? And, and, and that's, the, that's the reality of the people that's sitting in front of you. The, and you need... You must understand from my perspective that I need to preach on all three levels. I need to preach fire. Come on, let's go. Come on, guys. You need to wake up and get with the Lord again. And do you know Jesus? <laughs> That's a sermon. You, you have to have in your sermons, Albert, in your sermons you have to have all three. Yeah, yeah, sometimes more than three. That's true. So, but, but, but you, you have to at least keep in mind the information that you deal with. Uh, let, let me tell you a story of, of uh, David and Jonathan and uh, David, Jonathan shooting of the arrows. You know the story? Yeah. No, who's David and Jonathan and what arrows? <laughs> and uh, what's the Bible? <laughs> uh, do you read out of the scriptures in this church? So unfortunately, you, you have to sort of accommodate all three in, these guys want, listen, can you please have more scripture in your sermons? And this guy says, um, you can mention that there's scripture and talk out of the scripture. And these guys are seeker sensitive. Uh, you don't have to mention so many scriptures. Rather talk nice, encouraging stories to us. I'm never going to only stay here. You, you know me. I'll preach here. But I have to accommodate these guys as well. Okay. So just to understand that, in your ministry, Joe, with a healing service, you've got all three. 
How do you pray for that one? How do you pray for this one? And how do you pray for that one? It differs, eh? And you need to realize that. Met jou tannies. En met hulle anders te behandel. <laughs> Any questions? Dot? <laughs> ja. people before things. We need to disciple people, Shamina. She says discipleship is quite important and we need to disciple our followers towards a close relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to live this out and we can't, I, I, I also, she didn't say this, but we can't leave our disciples and let them sort of float towards this in their relationship and eventually end up here in their relationship with the Lord. We need to keep them aflame, going for the Lord. That's why you hear, because your leaders hear, and I want you every month hear to keep you in this seat. Proactive, strong, filled with the Holy Spirit, leading well, first generation leaders in this church, encouraging one another, uh, leading, discipling others well. That's my job with you. That's why we need time together. That's why I need you to make a commitment to be here once a month so that we can talk about this. Is that good? Yeah? Anybody else? You know, Shirach? Jeffra? Good. Demon? <laughs> you shall have a change cry in the school cry. And, but you need a good leader to lead them well. So usually these, kind, these people here in, in, in business and in church are entitled. They want things. They demand certain things. They're entitled. So. But that's the one thing that I want to emphasize over and over and over again. Leadership is loving people well. Getting to know them, getting to know where they are at, and loving them well to move them on. Good. That disappointed them. Yeah. This is the problem of second generation Christians and second generation leaders. 
they are hypocrites. They say one thing, but they do another thing. And the third generation, and if you think of the kids now, a lot of kids now, they they, they um, disillusioned with church because they see the hypocrisy in the leadership. And they say, we don't want anything to do. We'll be Christians, we'll follow Jesus, but we don't want anything to do with Christianity. And unfortunately, you can't be a Christian without being in church. That's the Lord's order. Sorry. I didn't say that. The Lord says you need to be part of His church. Don't neglect the, the, the assembly of the, the gathering of the believers. Good. So I'm all happy. Feynant? Mm. All of them said, yeah. But we counsel usually a wife and a man and a husband. And once they go, go through the whole marriage course, they, they are so changed, they want to become. Yes. Mm. And everybody that sits here from the couples have started out there. Sure. Beautiful. Yes. And that's discipleship. That's what Dot said, uh, Vainant, is to, to, to disciple them through the marriage counseling into this chair. Great. Wonderful. Can I do it in Afrikaans now? <laughs> But then you'll, have, you'll hear it a second time and you have to make as if you hear it for the first time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, donkey. You're going to hear it for the first time because it's going to be in Afrikaans. Yeah. Donkey, mag dat. Good. <laughs> Good. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for just establishing uh, this thing again that you want us to have a personal relationship with you. Not through the eyes of somebody else or through the experience of somebody else. You want us in love with you. And Lord, tonight each one of us as leaders decides. We, we decide again. We choose again to sit on this first chair. Say, Jesus, we follow you because we are passionately in love with you. Lord, we follow you also in this church as first generation leaders. Help us to be brave in our leadership. Help us to make good decisions. Help us to, to, to stretch ourselves in pioneering new things and have new ideas and, and, and think of your Holy Spirit as your creativity that is in us. Help us with that, Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you will give us the wisdom and the insight to lead people out of the second chair to the first one, out of the third chair to the first one. Thank you for relationship with you and Lord I, I thank you that, that I had the privilege of jumping from the third chair to the first one 
by falling in love with you. We all come again, Lord, and say, you are the love of our life. You're the lover of our souls. We love you with everything in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will bless everyone here. Lord, that they will experience the love of God our Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that is with us. Amen.